Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, it's one of those days. The computers are saying no today, so I apologise for, for everyone. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to uh, join in for um, the session today. And um, please uh, feel free to, um, to share any comments or thoughts in the chat as we go through the session. Um, so today uh, I'm talking about this concept about measurement enabling safety capacity. Um, just to bring that safety capacity uh, concept uh, in, into focus, it, it merges uh, out of the, the ideas that um, have, uh, have sort of grown from a couple of different uh, areas within the, the safety uh, research um, space. So if you go to the next slide, please, Sarah, thank you. Yep, great. Um, the, the safety differently um, itself has been built on thinking about what is uh, the evidence uh, showing uh, about you know, what is working and um, what is not working within that safety space. And as a, as a result, it's taken leads and inputs from all sorts of different areas um, in that domain. But the fundamental principles um, of safety differently uh, trying to engage and embrace these ideas of capacity. So shifting our space into thinking of people as a solution to harness and thinking about um, work uh, is, is that it's the product of positive outcomes, not the as, uh, absence of negative outcomes, and that uh, ultimately we're looking for engagement and shared responsibility uh, across um, our workforces. So the idea is it's a step into um, a domain that's thinking about how we build something rather than how we avoid something in that space. Uh, the next slide. just want to say if anyone can't hear just let them know in the chat because i can hear calvin but some someone is saying they can't over to you calvin okay thanks sarah yeah now what, what you're looking at there is um, a curve that has been you know, widely used uh, in this space it uh, arose from uh eric professor eric holnagel's uh, work uh, in this space and what he sort of started to get us to think about is firstly in this concept of safety one and, and safety two, but in in the space where we'd, in the safety one space, we'd focused all our attention and efforts are trying to understand the things that have gone wrong. So down at the, the left-hand side of this curve, it's the small, very small area of that curve is by looking at this small number of transactions in this space and thinking about how do we learn, develop, um, and uh, change the way that we're working from this space? His proposition was really that we need to think about the other side of the curve. Now, firstly, mostly things do go as, uh, as intended or planned in the system. Um, but also, if we look at it, about you know, more than 99.99% .99 of the time, things are going right. So. Uh, the proposition was, should, shouldn't we not be thinking about more about how things go right when, um, rather than how they go wrong? So if you're going to the next slide, Sarah. What Eric um, then started to sort of shape up with this um, idea about uh, thinking differently about what's going right and what's going wrong. So. In, in this space, thinking about capacity is, if it's going right, then it can't be going wrong at the same time. So with our approach to um, reducing the number of things gone wrong, it had been very much a model of constraint, you know, controls uh, put in place by um, um, rules, um, barriers, um, might be even um, culture and behaviour as such is to, to control that space. but. Uh, in Holnagel's model about thinking about capacity, he was thinking on the other side um, of the uh, equation, where what you want to do is think about how you enhance the abilities to respond, uh, and we'll talk about this um, in a moment, uh, monitor, anticipate and learn. So it's understanding to increase the number of things going right is about creating this capacity space. And to the next slide, sir. So within um, um, Eric's work, and there's a number of people in the work, Dave Snowden and Decker and, you know, um, and Woods and all, um, a range of people, but they started to embrace this idea of resilience engineering uh, and, and uh, 
uh, and Eric uh, and, and Dave and, and Nancy Levinson uh, put out a book in this space on resilience engineering. And one of the ideas that um, Eric was talking about this space is this concept of um, thinking about this notion of anticipating. So anticipating is really the um, how we plan for things. It might be procedures, for example, would be an anticipation is how we design um, work, work to be done, um, how we understand the nature of that work that's been done and what are going to be the things that enable that work, work to be done. The respond component of, of this is then thinking about, well, when things are changing or adapting, what are the nature of how we adapt and respond successful, successfully into that space? And then thirdly, the piece about um, uh, monitoring is understanding the performance metrics in, uh, in that space that help us understand the building of, of that capacity. And the learn space is then how we take this information and put it back into that process again of thinking about how we uh, design and intend work to be done and how we respond to that nature. So this is all built around this constant framework of engagement, um, engaging with um, the people uh, that do the work uh, in essence. So if you go to the next slide. So Eric, um, started to talk about this idea of um, work as imagined and work as done. And thinking the context of capacity and resilience was a recognition that we had to shift into a different space. We had to shift away from the domain of, if you like, leaving safety uh, in the hands of the, the safety experts uh, as such, uh, and letting them determine where the gaps and corrective actions and you know, the adjustments that needed to be applied and shift it more into um, immersing in trying to truly understand the nature of work and how work is done and how people adapt uh, in that in environment and looking at the connection between the nature of the, the work is uh, done and the work is imagined being the system you know the, um, and all of the ways that we document and set things up and trying to understand, do those things connect together? And if not, why they don't connect together and what might be done differently in that space to um, create greater relevance between the two things. We're all very familiar, I think, at looking at uh, complex safety management systems uh, that are in place. And um, as a result uh, of, of that, um, we, we end up with lots of things that when you go and look at the transaction of work, it doesn't have a great reflection on the nature of how people actually do the work. So following from, from this work, um, uh, uh, Michael Turmer and Sidney Decker uh, collaborated, um, really thinking about this space of measurement uh, as such. And um, and is, uh, in doing this, this work, you know, and Decker has written a lot um, about this space, has started to identify that the metrics that were being used um, uh, to measure safety have firstly not been helpful uh, and secondly, have not been accurate or reliable as such. And Decker has done a lot of work showing the, the shortcomings of the, the tools that we currently use, like total recordable incident frequency rates, um, you know, uh, and, tr and also, also lost time injury um, uh, frequency rates and the like. Um, so part of the work that Tuma sort of added to this, given his legal expertise, was also to show that these measures weren't helping in actually meeting or addressing um, the obligations that sat there within the, um, the legislation that we had to, had to uh, respond to. So there was no correlation between a very low TRIFA, for example, um, and being able to um, uh, uh, defend um, some uh, a safe place, safe system of work model when, when an unintended event um, occurred. That correlation was not able um, to be made. And so uh, what they proposed is we need to go back and think about this um, area of capacities and tie it into the thinking that had come in with the uh, the model legislation uh, that was um, brought into place uh, over 10, 10 years, years ago around the concepts of the elements of due diligence. So these 
elements of due diligence were carried across from the Corporations Act and they brought into the safety legislation. And so they suggest that um, there's what they need to do is um, measuring uh, capacities to acquire and maintain safety knowledge, you know, was the central to uh, understanding and building safety capacity in an organisation. So to do that, you needed to understand the nature's, uh, nature of operations. Uh, you needed to um, produce resource for safety. And the resource question is a bit broader than this. Uh, you needed to be able to demonstrate how you responded uh, to the risks and hazards that uh, are in the way that we do work. And you need to be able to uh, demonstrate engagement and compliance and therefore you know, have some capacity for, for assurance. So um, out of that work, out of that um, uh, research, um, a new model um, emerged. And uh, that model, if you go to the next slide, was the establishment of a, um, a new model of measurement and monitoring. Um, and this is uh, to measure uh, capacity uh, as such. And it's also done in a way is it's trying to align and provide a measure where you're able to demonstrate uh, how you're meeting the uh, obligations uh, that sit within those legislation. So within the, the legislation, there are, uh, there are six um, obligations. Now this, this in, um, in principle sits, when you look at this legislation, um, not only around Australia, but it also in other jurisdictions like the UK, um, and also in, in the US uh, and uh, Canada and the like. Now it's codified in different, different ways, but within Australia, this uh, is predominantly nearly in all states has been codified as, uh, uh, as an expectation. But the principles are, um, are pretty sound. You know, so the first obligation uh, that is in place is uh, an ob obligation for the organization to acquire and keep up to date uh, knowledge of health and safety matters. And there's some context text to that. So that's that's the first capacity um, to, that uh, organizations need to think about. The second is to understand the nature of the operations of the organization and generally the hazards and risks associated with those operations. Uh, and and, there, and there's, there's more to this than just having a critical com, um, uh, compliant, uh, well, critical uh, has a program in place and that people are applying the controls. You need to understand whether you understand the nature of those hazards correctly and whether the controls that you put in place um, are actually working in the operational context and not just from a safety context. Um, the resourcing um, is, is an interesting one. It's one that we'll explore a little bit more in the discussion today. Um, it's about ensuring that you've got the appropriate um, resources and processes in place uh, to eliminate or minimise risks to health and safety. But in doing that, it's not simply looking at the safety resource that's in place. It's actually going back to this question that sits around work as imagined and work as done. And it's about understanding work rather than understanding safety. And then uh, the next um, uh, capacity to understand is that of monitor, which is that you need to consider information um, the, regarding the incident hazards, risks, uh, um, and it can even be operational conditions to inform you about um, how the system is uh, performing as such. Um, the comply um, obligation is this, is then to understand, you know, what the capacity of the organisation is, is to meet its obligations. Uh, um, the safety domain. And then the, the final obligation is a verification capacity, which means, uh, and really this applies at a senior level within an organisation, is that um, you must personally and proactively verify that the provision and use of the resources and processes um, in the elements above um, are materially present uh, and that you're successfully providing those capacities in the organisation. So they're um, the six domains that sit um, within the space. So what occurred, what followed in that space was the um, some works to um, develop um, a set of um, measures uh, that could uh, align to these um, elements, and um, and they they've been developed into a due diligence index safety standard. And that standard is was released. Um, about the middle of last year, um, and it's a standard that is in the, the public domain. 
um, uh, you'll get this material um, as part of the uh, webinar today. Uh, but uh, you will be able to go to the Due Diligence Index um, Council, which is uh, in the public domain. Uh, and um, uh, from that uh, website, you can access the standard and the supporting material about um, how the, the different elements and capacities work in that space. So there's resources in place to um, take you uh, on that path. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. I'm just now I'm going to unpack each one of these capacities a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go through all the capacities today, but a selection um, of them. And just give you an insight as to how this idea of understanding a capacity uh, has, has been created within this um, standard and uh, measurement model. So the first one, you know, the first obligation is, um, is about to know, to acquire and keep up to date knowledge of health and safety matters. Well, what the standard has done is tapped into the concept of harnessing worker insights and feedback. So it goes back to Hagel, uh, Holnagel's uh, proposition. This goes back to harnessing um, expertise and knowledge from where work is done. And the concept of this is to put in um, um, a worker insight pro program and give that some sort of calibration uh, uh, in that space. So if you go to the next slide, Sarah. So just to give you a bit of context, now that the purpose of um, this particular element is to build leaders' understanding of health and safety as it relates to the organisation. So it's a, it's it's nearly a foundation setting um, for uh, building your knowledge of health and safety in the organisation. If you don't collect the information about you know the nature of health and safety in the organisation. Uh, it's going to be very hard to build the capacity and responses in, in the other parts of, of your process. And equally in this space, it, it's not just about collecting knowledge, but it's also trying to create this notion of relationships and trust that are occurring. So very much uh, the, the work that comes out of Decker's work is um, really thinking about that third pillar about shared responsibility within the system is how do you do that? So. The nature of this particular um, element is trying to encourage those transactions to be occurring in a uh, constructive and productive way. Um, so if you go to the next slide, just jump it. It's, it's a repeat slide, sorry. Yep, next one, please. Yep, so then just touching on this uh, concept of uh, worker insight, and think if you're not familiar with that, but there's a number of different ways that these can, things can be done. Um, and there's organisations that have put worker insights into a whole range of spaces. But in essence, that um, you want to um, have some activity um, that uh, uh, generates an interaction with workers at the site level, right? Um, and what you're trying to do from that is harness the insight of the workers to make better decisions about how safety um, uh, is incorporated into the nature of how work work is done. And the idea is to have all different parts of the organisation involved in these transactions in one way or, um, or another. Uh, so next slide, sir. So when we go into the standard, it has um, uh, a couple of inputs. Firstly, it is a system of capturing the worker insights that occurred. So you've got a way of saying, yes, uh, we've got those worker insights occurring. Um, and then we look at, you know, the insights and um, that uh, um, are collected during that, that process at determining whether they're being effectively closed out or not. And then there's a third element that's taken in, which we sort of probably describe like a, 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 an Uber feature of, of this process is providing feedback from um, the people that have been part of that transaction. So pe the wor workers that are uh, involved in worker insights get to actually put a rating back about um, uh, how they felt about that, that experience and might be about the response to that experience. And th the idea is just to calibrate this. So um, now within the standard itself, it's got the detail 
um, of the method and formula. I'm just going to outline today in the discussion uh, the, the, the general process in that space. So what happens is, is that is those three elements um, are calculated and it then goes into a five point scale to give a result. So on every one of these elements in this measurement of capacity, it's about uh, putting it into this um, scale uh, response and giving you a calib calibrated output for that. So on this particular cal calculation, it's, it's coming in at the middle of the scale on three and the language that you're seeing here used, which I'll show you a little bit later, is the language of resilience. So in, in the resilience language saying, well, uh, th this is in, a, is in a brittle state. So it's under tension as such. We, we need to um, increase the level of capacity uh, for this particular result. So if you go to the next slide. Second element is to understand, and this is really about uh, understanding hazards and the how those hazards um, are managed. Uh, it's quite important, um, uh, this particular uh, element, and uh, central to this is, is looking at the strategy. So if you look at the next slide. The purpose of uh, understand is really to build you know, the leader's understanding of the organization's operations and critical health and safety uh, risks, right? So um, it's thinking about what are the inputs. Now, we've traditionally looked at this through, you know, the unwanted events um, that have been occurring or maybe the counting of hazards. There's a whole range of things we've done in the space. It hasn't really been material about understanding the, the nature of um, how this process is working. So in the capacity um, uh, component for understand, it's about harnessing the use of learning teams in an organization. And the going back to Holnagel's uh, proposition about the curve of normal work is shifting our lens um, out of the, the space you know, of um, looking at just what's going wrong is then starting to look at normal work, when work is difficult, when work is, is successful. Um, and by using that learning team mode, we can really get an understanding of what's, what's helping or hindering in this space. So this metric is designed to drive that practice uh, within an organization. So uh, what, what it's seeking to do is driving more events of learning teams um, occurring within the organization. So the next slide. So just to, touch on learning teams um, um, briefly. It's um, it's a model that's based on appreciative inquiry. There's a number of different ways learning teams have been set up by, by different organizations. But in fundamentally, it's a principle of going to take the, uh, the view about those that, that do the work, looking at a particular work transaction or, or something that might be, you know, um, challenging or difficult um, in that space. And it's harnessing the knowledge of the uh, the frontline experts in that space and combining that with the knowledge of subject matter experts. So looking at the measure on the next slide. So in this, uh, what we uh, look at in this space is the number of hours that are invested in learning teams. Um, we take an experience rating from um, the people that participate in the, those learning teams, how they rate that, that experience. And, and calibrate this against the number, a total number of hours worked. So it's, it's trying to develop this combination between investing time and effort. Now with learning teams, there can be many different versions of it. A learning team can be one or two people, for example, or it might be 20 people um, in that space. So, so the hours, you might have lots of transactions of small learning team transactions, for example, or a few number of large learning team transactions. It's not, you're not prescribed as to, you know, what that sits in that space. It's about trying to propagate an activity uh, and the notion of curious inquiry. And again, you end up with the, the five point scale here. You can see on this slide, those um, indicators from that resilient speakers, whether it's in a critical state, a, fr um, a fragile state, brittle state, resilient state. Optimal is saying, you know, it, it's really op operating in the best state that's possible within that condition. So then we move um, to the next element, which is central to this capacity piece. So the next slide being resource. And again, you know, this is about trying to understand 
um, the nature of what is um, people are provided to do their work safely and successfully. Next slide. Now, the, the purpose of this is, is trying to have some insight into the, um, the worker um, capacity uh, that is there through what the organisation um, has provided. Um, and we look at this you know, in taking into the perspective of what the organisation thinks it needs and what people think they need and trying to understand the gap between those two things that um, a result of that. So next slide. So this very much um, taps into feedback from um, people at the front line. The, um, uh, the, the tool that's with, within the standard is designed to sample in three domains. Firstly, that domain of um, those that are doing the work. It then also samples from line management, supervisors and management uh, in the space about seeing um, how their needs are met. And thirdly, it looks at subject matter experts. That could be safety people, it could be engineers, it could be operational people that are uh, in that position of being a subject matter expert as such. So next slide. So in this model, what happens is there's a process of sampling um, from those, uh, those domains uh, to understand this concept of capacity being a link uh, between organisational capacity and operational demands. And I'll, I'll show you how that uh, breaks out uh, in, in a moment. Um, but the, the key concept is we're trying to look at that which the organisation provides and then see how that matches when what is expected of people when they do, do the work. So to the next slide. So this is this concept of uh, mapping resilience uh, in such to, to build this particular uh, concept. So you can see these two domains here that when we look at the capacity piece, all this is um, a question of what has been provided. So when we talk to the, when you sample from the front line, um, you ask them about the nature of tools provided um, and you ask them, you know, um, are these tools really helpful or are, or are they unhelpful? in doing the work that you need to be doing in that space. So are they fit for purpose and, and such? You go through and look at these other air, um, domains like equipment, resources, uh, information, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit deeper insight into this um, in a moment. And then um, it, it's then calibrated against, you know, what's the nature of your current work look like? So in the sampling, in this measurement method, it actually samples the work that was done on the previous day. So it's not for all time what you think about in that space. The concept is just to sample from that, um, that, that transaction of, you know, this is what the previous day um, uh, looked like. And in the surprises, things like, you know, did you encounter surprises, you know, unexpected work that needed to be done or things in a different way or things that didn't work, sample that and understand the delivery demands. This might be the goals um, that, um, or that you're expected to achieve, you know, to deliver the work in the end of a shift, end of a week, you know, um, those sorts of things. Limitations that are put, put upon, they could be a whole range of things that might relate to operational conditions and might relate to um, different teams coming together in that space. And if you're, you know, got goal conflicts, you know, um, if you're told that, you know, uh, safety first and um, that everything must be safe before anything's done, uh, but uh, you've got a conflict of you need to deliver this work and have it done by the end of the week or nobody's got a job. You know, <laughs> those, those sorts of things. As I understand, are you, uh, you know, is that something you're experiencing? And then the final piece is looking at the work plan for that day is how well did that work plan actually fit the, the work that actually occurred in that space? You know, um, so just going to the next slide, um, this just gives you a bit more detail uh, around um, the, the nature of the, um, of the capacities that we're looking at. So when we're, when we're looking at things like information, for example, we're, we're talking about the manuals, the operation system, safety information, technical data, um, schematics, drawings, online resources, all of those things. We're asking people, depending on what they're using, 
that is comes out of the system as such is um, how it meets their needs in that space. If you if you look at things like um, supervision and, and line management um, uh, in that space is you're really trying to understand is when people talk about um, their supervision or line management, do they see that supervision as there to help them, um, to help them be successful, to help them resolve problems, to, to bridge the gaps in that space? Or it is something that actually just puts more barriers and problems in place that they're expected to, to resolve themselves and such. So um, it's the nature of the capacity um, of that. Um, you're interested in, you know, the, the training that's provided in this knowledge space is, um, do people feel that they're actually provided with what they need to be able to do the jobs? Um, are the pe and when they're working with other people, you know, even understanding, do those people have the skills um, uh, and training, you know, that is uh, relevant and helpful to the work um, that they need to be doing in the space? And also the ability taps into, you know, the physical conditions, you know, um, that they're ex experiencing. It might be around um, uh, uh, fatigue issues with shift work. It might be around drug and alcohol use or psychosocial or, you know, there's a whole range of spaces, things in that space that affect the capacity of, uh, of people to function. So, so when you look at um, all of these things in this list, these are very much in the domain of thinking about uh, what the organisation is um, creating and providing as, as a function of the nature of the work that it wants uh, wants to deliver. So um, I, I really couch this in the terms that the workers are the recipients of all these things and the leadership and management are the creators um, and, uh, and also um, designers, you know, of all of these elements within within the system. So going back to this um, idea between workers imagined and workers done, all of these things are the product of workers imagined in one form um, or another. And going back to uh, our proposition is we're trying to narrow that gap. This is trying to understand the capacities or the lack of capacity that's in this space for what people actually need uh, to do. Uh, to do that stuff. Um, so it's the next slide. The demand space is that operational condition. Um, and as I was indicating before, you're looking at, you know, uh, in the current transaction of work, you sampling from people is what's the nature of interruptions? I'll, I'll take healthcare as an example here. You know, one of the big issues for nursing um, uh, staff is the number of interruptions that they have to deal with, with all sorts of other things coming to them whilst they're trying to perform a particular clinical transaction as such. So if there's a lot of surprises um, in that space, it's going to impact on their ability to successfully um, uh, do, the, do the work. Right. Um, and Work delivery demands is about, you know, the nature of understanding the performance expectations and whether they're achievable or not achievable. You know, are people given tasks that are really beyond what they um, uh, feel that they're capable um, of doing? Uh, is there insufficient time to do what uh, they need to do? So um, successfully managing this demands piece is, is a really important piece in tr when you start to look at um, safety performance and start to look at things like um, workarounds that might be occurring and those sorts of things. Well, it's, it's pretty easy to see that they're going, you're going to have those properties emerging when the work demands, you know, significantly outweigh um, the capability or the capacity of the team to meet those demands. And people are going to find other ways um, to shortcut that, that system to get to where they, um, they need to by the pressure of the, the management process that's in place. Um, in goal conflicts, there's lots of goal conflicts that mightn't just come within the organisation. They might come from, you might be working with a client that has their own, <coughs> sorry, um, constraints and constrictions and issues and that you have to meet with in that space. And that may provide goal conflicts in trying to do the work as it's uh, um, intended and as it needs to, to be delivered. Work plan is um, a very, you know, common one where there's often a uh, significant mismatch between uh, the work plan, and we're talking about the work plan in its 
current state, like planning for the day, planning for the week, you know, looking at that, that activity, process, project planning, all of those uh, work elements uh, as such. So if we go to the next slide. So what happens is it through this process is um, that each of those um, uh, uh, elements, uh, and I, yeah, I'll show them to you in a, in a sec, in the next slide, uh, are sampled in three domains. They're sampled at the point where work is done. They're sampled um, uh, from the subject matter experts and the subject from, they're sampled from uh, the management team. And the, the, you start to see how well the, um, this, both the system is meeting those respective needs um, uh, and what is happening on terms of uh, how the how well the organisation is managing the, the demand equation. So if you go to the next slide, this is what the, the, the data, the measure actually starts to look like. So basically the measure takes samples for tools, equipment, materials, procedures, work methods, supervision and management, um, communication, training skills, um, and uh, work demands, constraints, and, goal conflict. So that last one is the demand equation um, and the, the, the first four lines on, on that are the capacity equation uh, that sits within that. Um, and these uh, are then put into um, uh, the calculation. Um, and there's lots of data that you get out of this um, in the space because you can start to actually start to get a view of you know how fit for purpose tools are across the organization and where they're fit for purpose in certain operational conditions and not in other operational conditions it might be geography it might be the nature of, of work but it gives you somewhere to work, work and understand how well this is matched now the part, part of when we're moving space we're shifting this space and not looking at what would be traditional safety um, measures we're looking at measures of work but in the nature of that, safety is an emergent property of all of these things in that space. And it's really giving us some real knowledge about um, the things that are either creating safety capacity or, um, or diminishing safety capacity is the fit for purposes of those um, elements. Um, so we then, um, we, we're then able to look at those three domains and then the, the result of combining this data together is it then comes out and uh, produces a result on our resilience scale. So somewhere between um, critical um, and, and optimal. So what's the resilience state um, of the nature of what's been provided for work is done in the organisation? Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I'm skipping over uh, one in this process, um, the uh, comply one, because it's it's fairly transactional. It, it, it's actually looking at a legal compliance piece, but so it's it's important within due diligence index, but it's not directly related to the capacity piece for the discussion for today's uh, measures, but it follows a similar model. And the, that information is uh, available on um, the website. So, you know, the, um, the final often uh, option we'll uh, measure within the space is around verify. And the way that this has been done has been to actually tap into um, um, a model that where you're trying to understand engagement uh, in the space across the organisation. Uh, and to do that, um, a safety net promoter score has been developed. Now this, um, emerges from um, the global uh, net promoter score system, which is used across uh, industries to uh, measure all sorts of things. But a lot of it was originally designed just to, to measure service and customer satisfaction um, elements. Nearly every organization in the world uh, measures this and can give you their, their net promoter score. So this has been adapted to take out to be a capacity measure for, for safety. So if we go to the next slide. So this is what the, um, the measure looks like. Um, basically, if you're not familiar with net promoter scores, if you've ever answered a question um, uh, that says, you know, um, uh, would you recommend the way, you know, um, for example, it might be, would you re recommend this airline to 
um, a friend or family member. Um, give us a, a rating on a scale of one to 10. That scale is the net promoter um, score scale. And so simply uh, in this model, the same thing is then sampled for um, how safety is done in the organization, whether it would be um, recommended by the recipient of that question um, to um, a friend or colleague and they give it the rating. So when, what you're looking up there, the net, net promoter score system breaks the responses you get back into three domains. Um, detractors, passives, and promoters. So what it says, for example, is that um, for the promoters, they're the people who rate the response to that to a nine or 10 on that. They will actively go and tell other people, oh, you should do it like, you know, this company. They, uh, we're, um, the way that we do it here is the way that everybody should do it. And they'll recruit other people to say, you should do it that way. Um, the, um, the passives, uh, the score is saying, yeah, well, they're neither invested or not invested. And if you did something differently, they'd be okay with that as well. You know, so you haven't, uh, yeah, you haven't convinced them um, that it's great. And you haven't uh, also put the space where they think it's bad. It's just neutral in the space. Um, for a six and below, they're all um, put into a group of detractors um, and detractors, depending how far they're on the scale, um, might be if they're asked about it, they will provide a negative response down to the bottom of the scale where they'll actively go and, um, you know, uh, and raise issue and complaint um, about, you know, uh, what they're experiencing as such. So you're trying to, so what we're trying to understand here is this capacity of, of engagement and how well, so if you go back and think about those, those previous areas about, worker insights and learning teams and the resources that we're putting putting in place. Um, if if you don't if you're getting a score that's not working well um, from your engagement score in that place, you start to have lots of other data to go and look at to understand well why are we in this space? Um, we start to look at the resource score and say, oh it's interesting that you know um, 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 our, our policies and procedures and the tools we provide and all those things are not scoring very very well. You know, so you can have the greater safety lines that you like, into, but if you're not giving people what they need to be able to effectively function, to do their work safely and successfully, um, they're not going to reflect well on saying, well, we've got a great safety management system um, as such. So that's the nature of that. So if you go to the final slide uh, in the set, this is just to give you an, an idea. It can be represented in different ways, but what you get out of this process is, um, you get a resultant picture of where you are uh, on that scale. So in each of those domains of how resilient uh, that you are uh, in that space. And obviously the more you move to the outside um, of that diagram, uh, the more resilient you are in that specific um, domain. Um, and what you're intended to do here is to be able to get a, um, a simple uh, numeric output um, which uh, is, is obvious immediately to the recipient of that. So senior management, for example, you can quickly understand whether they're, um, how they're performing uh, and where they need to provide some more focus uh, and attention to uh, in that space. Um, if we compare that to something like a TRIFA or LTFR, for example, people get a number, um, but that number, if I was being you know, a little bit harsh, um, the knowledge of the leadership team is only to know that that number should be smaller. They, they don't really understand the context of that number and what forms and even the difference between a TRIFA and LTIFR and all those things, they're too subtle. So what we're trying to do in this is provide, you know, something that gives you um, a relatively simple framework, but you can then provide um, intelligence behind that about what constitutes that and therefore where the organization needs to think about capacity and resource uh, as an approach. So that brings us to um, the final slide, Sarah. So I've, I've, um, that takes to a point if people want to raise any questions or follow up. But like I said, um, the material, this will be shared in the slide pack, obviously, from the session today. Uh, but also, you know, more than welcome to go to um, the due diligence uh, index council. So if you search uh, due diligence uh, index uh, in, in the browser, it will come up, I'm sure. Uh, but there's also a link provided in the slide, slide pack as well to 
go and have a look at that information. Um, and, you know, uh, in essence, if you embark upon putting some of these things in place, you should have the resources you need to there. Um, and uh, you can join us with a community of people that are, are working to develop this idea of capacity. Um, there was a question put in the chat, sort of, Calvin. It's someone, yep. uh, Eric says, wouldn't the number of WICO, WICO, less, yep. be less than equal to the TWI? Uh, total, I'm, I'm just trying to remember now, because we've got the, his, ta they're taken out of the formula, and um, I'll have to go back. Um, worker insight. Um, yeah, I have to go back and have a look. Um, er Erica, could you put it in the question panel? Um, if just a bit, be a bit more clarity. Um, she also said, is action considered in the understand measure? No. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, oh, um, I think some of the questions are coming through. Um, oh. Matt says, uh, it's, nice to, it's nice to see Matt on the call. Matt and I have known each other for a long time, so uh, great to hear from you, Matt. <laughs> okay, well, Matt says, wonderful work by you and the triumvirate, that's how you say it, invaluable guideline for the officer DDD obligations. I've always been bothered that the need for knowledge in the reasonably practical standard has been neglected. The WHS law reform helps. After the webinar yesterday, I was very disturbed about the state of academic integrity in our profession. This pre presentation has restored my <laughs> confidence. Yeah. Catch up again soon, Matt. Yep. Well, I'll take I'll take Matt up on that, or we'll catch up with him again. But um, also, Matt you know, obviously, you know, um, uh, sits uh, in Western Australia um, uh, on the board with the regulator there, um, so it's very. I'm very grateful for that feedback. Right. I seem to think I know Matt as well. Um, okay. Uh, Dennis said, I attended the DDI launch last year and was blown away. It's a no-brainer. Cheers. Yep. And um, that's all the questions. So I think you, you covered everything well. I, I just want to apologise to everyone because obviously our work did not go as normal at all today. And yes. I tend to panic as well, but Calvin quickly sent the PowerPoint to me, but we'll put it as a PDF also in the um, email, which will go out in a few hours. So thanks, Calvin. Thanks. And um, technology sometimes gets us there, but uh, we, uh, we did the work around today. <laughs> We did. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for two webinars in a row this week. Um, good work. And we'll talk, see you again next week, hopefully. Right. Thanks, Calvin. Thank you. Bye.